everybody. How are we doing? Uh, video number 11. Mike Biamonte, FBI, School of Operational Medicine. Welcome back. Uh, things are going really well. Uh, last time I checked, we were over 3,000 views, so that's phenomenal. Can't thank you enough for your participation and helping out. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, let's see. Let me check my notes. Admin stuff again. Nothing sensitive or classified. All is well. Hope everybody's COVID-free. Uh, let's talk about burns. I was kind of going back and forth as to what I wanted to cover on this one. Uh, we've covered airway, we've covered patient assessment, pharmacology. I want to get into medical emergencies. I don't want to forget about trauma. And the reason I don't want to forget about trauma, I think there's a lot online uh, in the way of trauma training videos. TCCC does a fantastic job of putting out trauma videos uh, or educational pieces online. Uh, oh, wait, before I forget, shout out to LA County, uh, Squad 51. Pretty cool. Uh, I was there a couple of years ago, my good friend Coob from, uh, from LA, and LA County and LA City, uh, LA Coroner's Office. Let me go ahead and throw this out there. If you ever want to go to the coolest gift shop in the world, LA County Coroner's Office. I know, sounds crazy, but if you want to go somewhere, I guess I just endorsed something I said I wasn't going to do, but man, out of this world. Uh, I was in the, uh, setting up a cadaver lab, I was in the LA County Coroner's Office waiting area, and uh, Coob, the guy I was with, elbows me, he says, hey, you want to go into a gift shop? I said, gift shop? This is a coroner's office, what are you talking about? He goes, come and check it out. Fantastic. It's like a tourist attraction. It really is wild. Anyway, uh, while we were there, I said, hey, where's, you know, Squad 51, uh, Emergency, Roy, you know, and, and Johnny Gage and that kind of jazz. And he goes, oh, it's right around the corner. So sure enough, we drove past there. It looks exactly the same as it did uh, during the movie or the show in the 70s. Uh, so Koo was nice enough to send me a shirt. So shout out to L.A. Okay, where was I? I just, where my mind works. I just got sidetracked. Oh, how I got the burns. Uh, I can do videos on hemorrhage control, I can do videos on, uh, you know, not to say that that's been overdone, it's never, uh, you never learn enough about it, but I've already covered shock in pathophysiology, so I'm not going to get into that again, we've already seen that. Uh, trauma is trauma. A lot of people don't talk about burns, for whatever reason, uh, it's not a, a good topic. For those of you who have ever treated somebody with burns, or God forbid, for those of you who have ever suffered from burns, there's nothing fun about it. It's an insult to the senses. It's an insult to see it, uh, to smell it, to hear the person in pain. You can almost taste it in your mouth. It has this irony kind of flavor. It's, it's, a, it's a very weird smell. It sticks in your nose for a few days. Um, but I wanted to talk about burns and the importance of treating burns properly and transporting them to the proper uh, facility. And then we can get into medical topics a little bit later on. Uh, we're not going to forget about trauma, don't misunderstand. Uh, but I think in our world, uh, especially in the tactical environment, we tend to focus more on trauma because that is our wheelhouse. But we can't forget about the medical side of things. And I think that's everybody's weakness is medical emergencies. So let's talk about burns in this section. Um, and... Uh, I do love this video, uh, this this movie. So let's let's talk about burns. This means to me how long I've waited for the pleasure of another human being. And sometimes in our preoccupation with worldly matters, we tend to forget the simple pleasures, that are the basis for true happiness. Again, Mel Brooks, can't deny it, genius. So when we talk about burns, we're going to go back to anatomy and physiology first, of course. You know me. Uh, we got to go back to A and P. So we'll look at anatomy and physiology of the skin primarily. And we'll touch on a little bit of patho, uh, not a whole lot. We'll talk about burn shock. Um, we'll talk about the causes of burns, type of burns, first, second, third, and fourth, and different terminology that goes with that. Uh, we'll talk about burn shock. We'll talk about some of the treatments that are out there on the BLS level, of course, and the ALS level. Um, we'll uh, give you some tips and some tricks on fluid management for the ALS folks. But with burns, it's, uh, we are, a, again, a bag of water. That's what we are. We are a protein-lined uh, bag of water. So the best way for me to describe our skin in relationship to heat is the whites of an egg. Right? So you take an egg, you crack it in the pan, and you cook it. That 
egg white starts off very gelatinous and very fluid, uh, kind of not to say like our skin, but uh, very much a, a very loose protein, where if you introduce some heat to it over time, it'll start to solidify and firm and form up and become delicious. And that's, uh, that's our skin, essentially. So when we look at burns, what I want you to keep in mind is time and temperature. So when we talk about time and temperature, that's the what's going to dictate the severity of a burn, how a burn presents. And we'll go over and dispel some myths about what burns look like. So uh, when we talk about burns, again, time and temperature. Hey, man. Mr. Joshua, your left arm, please. Oh, hey, <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ, man! You guys are fucking crazy, man! Come on, man! Mm. Yes. Uh, Bunton burger. Yow! So, looking at those two videos, you see Mr. Joshua. Uh, that was some time, and although it was just a lighter, so it's not a huge amount of temperature, it's enough to where that thing sits there, it's, it's going to do some damage. And then if you're one hair away from a tree, one hair away from living in a tree, like myself, uh, you get that burned hair, sm Ugh, it's disgusting, right? So that's Mr. Joshua. Well, then you had Kramer, and we're just kind of, we all did that, you know, we were all stupid at one point, we're trying to impress whomever, and we were... well, there wasn't enough time. It wasn't enough temperature to hurt us. Now, take a blowtorch, you know, a welder's torch or something like that, and try and do that. Well, it's a different story. Now that's a much higher temperature, although it's not a lot of time. So you have to balance out the equation, time and temperature. So let's go ahead and look at this slide here for anatomy and physiology. This is what we've already been over in video one. We talked about AMP. Uh, we talk about the epidermis, the dermis, uh, the subcutaneous layer. Uh, so when we start to talk about first, second, and third degree burns, or superficial, partial thickness, full thickness burns, we're talking about the areas of the skin that are being affected, whether it's just the dermal layer, the subcutaneous layer, uh, rather the, uh, the epidermal layer, the uh, dermal layer, the subcutaneous layer, all the way to a fourth degree burn. Then you're getting down into muscle, getting down into bone, and that's a real nasty, nasty burn. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about all of those in general. So when we look at this diagram, nothing exciting, nothing earth shattering. It's a diagram we've seen before. Uh, it's very easy to, to look at this and say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Although it's grossly uh, exaggerated in its size as far as compared to our skin and what we're looking at. This is the areas we're talking about as far as being burned. Uh, so when we look at the nerves, look in the dermal layer, and you'll see that area there of nerve endings. Because later on, we're going to talk about whether a third degree burn or a full thickness burn hurts. And that's always been, well, you know, a full thickness burn doesn't hurt, or a third degree burn doesn't hurt. Okay, yeah, you want one? No. <laughs> Nobody wants one, so yeah, granted it doesn't hurt, but now you've got dead tissue. Because now look at the veins and arteries, and look at where they reside, and look at the blood vessels and blood flow, and think about the depth of a burn. We'll talk about blanching later, and how it's to sort of determine whether you have viable skin or not, uh, from our perspective, from an EMS perspective, is whether your skin is going to blanch. So if you do blanching, if you push down, matter of fact, let me pull this slide down here. So when we talk about blanching of the skin, let's go ahead and talk about this now while we're on topic. Let's talk about blanching of the skin. If I push down and let go, I don't know if you, see, if you can actually see it or not. See that blanching? You see that white discoloration when I let go? And you can even see it on my nail bed when I do it. If I squeeze, my nail bed turns white, and I let go, and it turns pink again. That's blanching. And as a general rule, we always talk about with hypoperfusion and shock, you want there to be a less than two second cap refill. We're not talking about shock here. We're talking about salvageable skin. So if somebody is significantly burned and you go to blanch their skin and it doesn't blanch, well, that's a poor prognosis at best for the, for the viability of that skin. 
because that means if you look at the di if you look at the diagram that we had, I've got it here in front of me. But if you look at the diagram we had, uh, all your blood vessels and nerve endings are in that dermal lining. So if you burn down that far and you have a full thickness burn or third degree, you've destroyed those blood vessels, which means there's no way that skin is ever going to heal. That is going to be necrotic dead skin. That's a third degree burn. Hence the reason also those nerve endings running in there. Those nerve endings are burned away, which is why that skin technically doesn't hurt. But we're going to see what's called the Jacksonian thermal wound theory here in a little bit and how you have these zones and these areas around a burn where granted the central area of the burn most significantly uh, affected may be dead and may be painless. Everything around it hurts like a son of a bitch. Uh, so we'll talk about pain management as well. So let's move on. Let's talk about different uh, reasons that you could be burned. All right, so we look at this slide here. We're looking at thermal burns, chemical burns, electrical burns, radiation burns. I mean, there's a number of different reasons you can be burned. For the most part in EMS, uh, I'd like to say that we deal with all of these except radiation. If you're dealing with a radiation burn, uh, you're in a whole different ballpark, quite frankly. But for us, stop the burning as far as treatment goes. And we're going to talk about treatment later. But end all to beetle, stop the burn, put it out. Uh, you know, stop it from burning as best you can. And I always think about it this way. Even if you pull somebody out of a structure fire or they were in a car that was on fire or their clothing was on fire or whatever, stop the burning. When someone's cooking a roast, and I am no chef, that's for sure, but if you're cooking a, a roast beef or you're cooking anything in the oven or on a barbecue or what have you, and you pull it out of the oven and put it on top of the stove and let it sit there and sit, you know, before you're getting ready to cut it up or whatever, what is that piece of meat still doing? Well, it's still cooking. Well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we are no different. We are a walking sack of fluid, sack of meat, whatever it is you want to call us. We're no different than the roast that you see uh, in the, 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 the butcher section of your supermarket. Um, so when we are exposed to heat over time, we're cooking. When you pull us out of that heat for a short period of time, we are still cooking. So thermal burns are pretty significant in that aspect, but we have to stop the burning first and foremost. Chemical burns are different because it could be an acid, it could be an alkali, it could be a necrotic type of uh, situation going on. And that'll dictate what kind of burn you have. As a general rule, dilution, water. Clear it off. Now, of course, we talk about different, if it's a powder, you should brush the powder off and you get into the textbook of it all. Okay, from an EMS perspective, if you have some kind of a chemical burn, dilution, dilution, dilution. All right, rinse it off. Fresh water, at least 20 minutes, uh, if you have the means to do that. In some situations, you're not. Uh, but dilution is going to be key. Electrical, turn the power off. <laughs> I mean, nothing else to say. Let me go ahead and pull this slide down. And I think, and I've, in my time, I've seen patients suffer from all of these burns. I can't necessarily say I've seen anybody suffer from radiation burns, but from an electrical perspective, uh, years ago when I was in the military, uh, we ran 911 on the base, and there was a gentleman uh, working on a ground transformer. Long story short, this ground transformer blasted this guy. I mean, knocked him back a good 50 feet from the ground transformer. And of course, we made sure the scene was safe. We came in, and this guy was just bad. <laughs> he was sick. I don't know if you remember the, the sitcom Taxi, and Jim Magnitowski, and the, oh, that, the hippie guy. That's what this guy sounded like. Uh, it sticks in my head. These are the things that stick in your head you know, with these patients sometimes. He's laying on the ground. He's got both of his shoes and his feet blown off of his body because basically the energy went into his hand. These are ground transformers. I'm no electrician, but he got blasted. The electricity went down his arm. His arm was all cooked. Down through his chest, out both legs, and blew both of his shoes off. He died. Uh, he was alive when we had him, but he wasn't long for this world. But it sticks in my head. All I remember him saying, he's laying there. And he was saying, oh, I fucked up. Oh, I fucked up. That's all he would say. Um, so, but he had a number of different things going on. We'll talk about electrical burns later. So when we look at these different types of burns, it isn't necessarily so important that we figure out how someone got burned. 
we just want to stop the burning, dilute uh, the burned area perhaps, make sure the power is secured, and then take care of the burns afterwards. So we'll get into treatment of that later. So when we talk about depth of burn, let me go ahead and put this slide up. Superficial partial thickness, full thickness. Uh, some of us are used to first, second, and third degree, and that's fine. Uh, whatever floats your boat, I could care less what you call it. But uh, a superficial burn is really nothing more uh, than a sunburn. That's really all it is. Where a partial thickness burn is a sunburn with blisters, uh, where a full thickness burn, and I always try to get this across to people and have them understand it. When I talk about a third degree burn, I do a word association challenge, if you will, in class. I ask the students, all right, third degree burn, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Nine times out of ten, what a student says, oh, it's charred. Like, uh, like it just came off of a, a grill or a barbecue. Okay, in some instances, that's correct. So if you have a Mr. Joshua going on and you're holding a flame right onto the skin, yeah, you're going to get charring. That's normal. However, if this is a patient who's just suffered from radiant heat, they happen to be in close proximity to heat, uh, high heat, and they're cooking, what will end up happening is these patients will turn a waxy white, not... Uh, uh, not charred. It's hard to describe. Let me pull this slide down. And I'm going to show you a picture here in a minute of a third degree burn. And again, one of my best, worst examples, if you will, uh, two different scenarios. One, uh, there was a, a family of three sleeping together in an attic apartment. This was in New York. And they were overcome by smoke first, thank goodness. So, them, you know, this is what helps me sleep at night. They didn't feel anything. They were asleep and it was what it looked like uh, father, uh, wife, and, and young child all spooned together in one bed. It was an attic. Uh, they were in an attic apartment. First, second floor went up, and they were cooked, but they were fused together. That was the odd thing. So as these proteins in our skin melted, they fused together, which is a little disgusting, but that's what happened to these patients. So they were truly charred. Fourth degree burns, dead. I mean, there was nothing. They were just one big mass now. The other one that sticks with me and resonates is a, a young kid was pulled out of a structure fire and put on the front lawn for me to take care of. And when I approached this kid, he could have been any more than maybe eight years old, but he had no identifying characteristics of hair or skin for me to be able to tell, was well, this kid white, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, nothing that mattered. But, you know, if I had to do a report and check a box somewhere... I, other than saying he was a little boy or a little girl, I couldn't tell. But the kid had underoos on. Again, the things that stick in your head. I remember the underoos. And I remember pulling the underoos back a little bit. And underneath the underoos, uh, there was uh, brown skin, like African-American skin. But he had no shirt on, no pants, no socks, no nothing. His hair was burned away. And he was white. Waxy white with the exception of what was underneath the underoos. So when you blanched and you pushed anywhere on his body, now he was unconscious, I ended up intubating him. He died soon after, unfortunately, but probably fortunately for him, he was, he was in rough shape. Um, but when you push all over his body, he obviously didn't feel anything because he was head to toe, full thickness burn, but there was no charring. It was all absolutely white. So I want to get you out of that uh, mindset of, well, if they're third degree burn, they've got to be charred. Mm -mm. They could be a waxy white. So just keep that into, keep that in mind. All right. Well, here's a quick picture. Um, this is me when I came back from the beach. This is a uh, first degree burn. No, this is not me. Uh, this, for a variety of reasons, that is not me. But here's your standard first degree burn. We've all had it before. Uh, sunburn, very uncomfortable. Yeah. Hurts. You feel like you want to die depending on how much you have. Uh, but you're not going to die. Uh, next slide is second degree burn. Here is first degree burn with blisters. So the question that always typically comes up is, what do we do with the blisters? Do we, do we pop them? No, leave them. The blisters are Mother Nature's way of trying to stave off infection, fight infection. This is all the fluids of the body. Remember we talked about in prior videos, uh, trying to fight off infection. And this bursa, these these balloons, uh, these these blisters that pop up, 
um, the Boule, I believe they're called, B-U-L-L-A. Um, this is just Mother Nature's way of trying to fight off infection. Those blisters are going to pop just naturally. Don't be the one to do it because once you pop those, well, now you've opened up that conduit for microorganisms. The biggest thing that burn units and burn centers are trying to fight is hypothermia, hypovolemia, infection. Uh, those are the three big ones. So any burn unit you ever visit or burn center you visit, you'll tend to see that's their, uh, their Lex Luthor, their, their, the thing they're always trying to fight is infection, hypothermia, and hypovolemia. Because think about what your skin provides for you. It is a barrier. That barrier keeps fluid in, right? or a bag of water, keeps microorganisms out, and it helps thermoregulate. So if you burn away that skin, well, now you have nothing to hold water in, so we start to ooze plasma or fluids, right? We start to have that open conduit for microorganisms, and we also now take away the thermal barrier. So now our patient's gonna be very prone to hypothermia. So things to consider. Next slide now is you'll see an example of when we start talking about the Jacksonian thermal wound theory, kind of keep this picture in mind. You do have a little bit of charring. I believe that more to be dirt than anything else in this picture, but you see the area where there used to be a blister, that outline along the thumb and along the palm, but you also see some areas that are bright red, which means they're perfused, which means chances are that skin is going to be salvageable. However, you also see some white, white, white skin there. That's an example of a full thickness burn or third degree burn. Obviously, this person grabbed a hold of something uh, and it was hot. Who knows what it was? What you'll find a lot of times in child abuse cases is a kid with burns on their palms similar to this. And the parents tell you, oh, well, they grabbed something off the stove and it burned them and... No, chances are uh, that wouldn't happen. Now, most of the time, if you grab something and it's hot, you immediately let it go. It's a reflex. And yes, you'll have some minor burns on your fingertips, maybe some blistering and whatnot, but nothing crazy. Uh, something like this, where you have full thickness burns, that means the hand was held there for whatever reason, or this individual was holding on to something. Who knows why? I don't know the backstory. Uh, so if you see a kid with burns on their palms uh, like this, think child abuse, unfortunately, because chances are mom and dad held that kid's hand on something hot as punishment. You'll also see that in scalding burns of the feet. Um, you'll see a distinct line at the ankle or the calf, and mom and dad will say, oh, the kid uh, jumped in a boiling hot shower or tub, rather, and um, they burned their feet. No, you jump into a, a, a hot tub and it's hot, you're going to splash and jump out. You're going to see splash marks uh, with kids who have a perfect line, looks like a sock line on their ankle or on their mid-calf, uh, a perfect burn line. That kid was held in the water as punishment. And that's usually what you'll see for child abuse. Uh, you'll also see cigarette burns. Uh, I remember a, a couple in Brooklyn, of all places in the world, tried to convince me that they're young daughter was just eaten up with the rampant mosquito problem in downtown Brooklyn. Yeah, I'll tell you, there's not a huge mosquito problem in Brooklyn, at least not when I was there. Um, this kid did not have a square inch of her body that didn't have a little fresh circular burn or old scarred circular burn on her body from head to toe. And they tried to convince me they were mosquito bites. So yeah, you'll run into all kinds of assholes out there. What are you going to do? All right. Uh, this next slide here is just giving you an example, again, of first, second, third, and fourth. It's, a, it's just a cartoon picture, but it also describes to you and gives you an idea of the depth of uh, first degree burn just being that partial thickness sunburn, where fourth degree goes down through the muscle and can actually start to get into bone. Uh, that's dead tissue. There's nothing we're going to be able to do about that. So, let me go ahead and pull this slide down. All right. Everybody good and depressed? Yes, I know my stories are depressing, especially when it comes to burns. There's nothing good about burns. Uh, actually, you know what? Being that we're talking about just depressing shit and burns, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this video. Now, I guess I'll risk my care. Now, don't inhale until the tip glows. Mm. Mm. 
Again, you can't, it's just funny. I don't care who you are. Mel Brooks is just funny. That's good stuff. How can you make a burn funny? Mel Brooks can make a burn funny. I don't know how. All right, well, let's talk about different areas where you are prone to burns. And you can be burned on your arms, legs, back, torso. Uh, yeah, and it can be significant. What's going to kill you the fastest? How about this? Think about it this way. You roll up to a house that's on fire. And you notice that the fire is on the second floor, third floor, uh, whatever. And you happen to notice a body laying on the ground outside of a third floor or second floor window that's bust out. And the person's lying there. Okay, person probably jumped. You come up and you look at this patient, you start to assess this patient, and they're burned. They're significantly burned. Uh, but they're shocky, and they appear to be in shock. Uh, the question is, is it the burn that's causing the shock? The chances are the answer is no. A burn shock takes a few hours to kick in, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But chances are this person is shocky because of the trauma of jumping out of the window. Or maybe somebody tried to kill them, and they shot them, they stabbed them, they beat them half to death, and they lit the house on fire. Uh, so, again, keep your mind open. Uh, it's very easy for us to zoop, get tunnel vision with burns. Remember that that, uh, that 10,000 foot view and the, the video of the gorilla that we talked about, that perceptual blindness. Um, take all things into consideration. And there could be a multi-trauma patient. If their airway is not burned and they're burned all over their body, they've got a little bit of time before they start getting shocky. Uh, but if their airway is burned, well, we have immediate complications. So let's take a just look at this picture here. As you can see, when we start to talk about burn shock here in a little bit, we're going to talk about third spacing and, uh, and vascular permeability because of these uh, chemicals that are released during the burn. Uh, but look at the, the facial features of this individual here. Eyes are swollen shut. Chances are nose is swollen shut. They've got an OPA in as a bite block. they got an OG tube in. they got an ET tube in. I've intubated my fair share of, of burn victims. And if you don't get them intubated, uh, a tube down into their trachea, within the first few minutes after they're pulled out of a, a structure fire, you're going to lose that airway, and you're going to end up having a crichum, which is really, really stressful to say the least. With airway burns, if we put an NPA, an OPA, even a superglottic airway in, is that going to be enough to protect the airway? Probably not. How do we know somebody has upper airway burns? Well, you know, there's a number of different things. Again, it comes down to time and temperature. What another myth I want to dispel is airway burns and who typically suffers from them. So let me go ahead and pull this slide down. So we talk about airway burns. Who is going to suffer something like that? That last picture we saw. Chances are, and again, I don't know the backstory. This is just me speculating. Um, this is somebody who was in a, who was found in an enclosed space. Or maybe their clothing was on fire, and but you'd see more charring in the face if that were the, if that were the case. Usually, people who are found in a structure fire, they're typically found on the floor because they pass out because of the, the gases and the toxins in the air, and they go unconscious. And the flame doesn't actually kill them right away. It's typically the poisons in the air. Um, but while they're lying there, they're starting to inhale superheated gases. But they're in an enclosed space. So these are the people that typically suffer the more significant upper airway burns. Because as we bring those superheated gases in, are the oral mucosa and the water in the oral mucosa, the nose, mouth, tongue, upper airway, they absorb all that heat and they swell very quickly. Uh, within a few minutes, that airway closes off. The tongue literally pops out of the mouth. I've seen that more than a few times. That makes it so complicated for us as pre-hospital care providers to manage that airway. Because the tongue is in the way, you can't get it out of the way. Uh, the only thing you can do then is probably crike them, that's about it. So you're trying to manage that airway and intubate them before that happens, if at all possible. Um, but if you're just a victim of a woofum, as I call it, we've all done it before, we've had that propane gar barbecue outside, and it's not, you know, it's not working, and you're, you got the gas on, you're trying to light it, and all of a sudden, woof, woof, yeah, okay, maybe you burn your eyebrows and you, you, know, you burn the hair off your arm, which isn't the case for me, but, and you smell like a burned dog for a little while. 
but you didn't inhale that superheated gas for a, a good period of time to have that swelling. So you don't have the what's called the carnubinous sputum, uh, the bright red tongue, the difficulty swallowing, the hoarseness, the difficulty breathing. The, these are typically your telltale signs of somebody who may have a significant upper airway burn. If you have somebody who usually has a mustache or a beard or and now there's nothing, <laughs> it's all burned away. All right, yeah, there's a high index of suspicion there that person may be suffering an upper airway burn. So these are things to take into consideration. These are the things that will kill someone the fastest. So from the BLS perspective, if you have somebody that you suspect has these significant upper airway burns and they have hoarseness, carnubinous sputum, and I'll show you a picture of carnubinous sputum uh, right now. That's a pretty drastic example of carnubinous sputum. It talks about strider. It talks about a number of different things. Um, just as a matter of semantics, Asthma and wheezing is an expiratory lower airway sound. Right, so when they hee, when they exhale, you'll hear that lower, within the lungs, you'll hear the wheeze. Strider is different. Strider is upper airway around the neck area, and it's, a, it's an inspiratory issue. Uh, so from me to you, if you physically hear somebody suffering from upper airway strider, whether it be anaphylaxis or burns or whatever the case may be, there's a good chance that person's airway is probably already about 75 to 80% occluded. And it doesn't take much more for that airway to go fully occluded. Uh, so that's a, 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 a sick, sick patient. So from a BLS perspective, if you suspect that somebody is having an upper airway issue because of burns, You've got really one of two options. Uh, you find an ALS provider, and hopefully they can RSI them or sedate them enough to put them down and intubate them and manage the airway before it completely swells shut, or go like hell uh, to your local trauma center. Does this patient need to go to a burn center right away? The answer is no. If you fear airway complications ensuing in the next few minutes, get them to a, a level whatever ER. Let them manage it quickly, all right? RSI them, sedate them, get them innovated. Then they can transfer them. But if you lose that airway, all right, you've lost that patient. That's the sad truth of it. All right. So now that we've talked about upper airway issues, uh, let me stay on track here and talk a little bit about the, uh, the Jackson Thermal Wound Theory. We'll go through this quickly, and I'll show you this picture here. Uh, the Jackson's thermal wound theory basically states, depending on, again, let's think about Mr. Joshua. With Mr. Joshua, he had that flame going in one spot, concentrated for a period of time. So what he's going to have is that zone of coagulation or your full thickness burn, because that's where we had the highest temperature for the highest amount of time. That's going to be your dead, painless tissue. But everything around that area, the zone of stasis, uh, the zone of hyperemia, um, this is now your second and first degree burn areas, which are extremely painful and salvageable. But remember, we're still cooking until that burning stops, uh, that, that flesh is still cooking. Does that mean that we as BLS or ALS providers have to look at a wound and say, well, Jackson's thermal wound theory states, no. I'm just giving you an example of when we talk about full thickness burns not hurting. Well, yes, that's true. But unless you're that little boy laying on the front lawn that I experienced where this kid was basically, you know, full thickness burn 95% of his body, uh, there is going to be a significant amount of pain because there's going to be surrounding areas of second and first degree burn. So I'll go ahead and I'll pull this slide down. So... Okay, now we've got a patient who's burned, whether it's first, second, third, you know, fourth degree burns, whatever. Um, uh, we've looked at them, we've assessed their airway. Now we want to start to look at, okay, what's the potential for them to really be sick and start to die on me anytime soon? Well, within the first few hours, again, if there's no upper airway involvement and it's not polytrauma or multi-trauma, the burns themselves are not going to kill that patient and within the first hour or so, which is where we live and breathe, is in that first hour. 
So I'm not looking at you saying, oh, well, don't worry about it then, you're fine. No, we, we have steps we have to take from pain management, number one, uh, to, to fluid therapy, to choosing the right facility to transport them to, to pain management, that I mentioned pain management. Um, so let's look at burn shock for a second. And this is going to take us back to pathophysiology. Again, there's a method to my madness is why I cover things in the order that I do. So when we look at the first 24 hours following a burn, it talks about the coagulation and necrosis of tissue. Okay, that's that burned tissue. But what ends up happening internally is the release of these toxins, these vasoactive toxins secondary to burn. And what this does is this gets to the capillary level and creates, just like with uh, uh, acidosis, we talk about acidosis and lactic acidosis and, uh, within shock. Well, this is shock created by burns and these chemical mediators that are sent out. Well, now you have increased capillary permeability and you have vasodilation. So what does that do to the container size? Think about that bottle of water. Well, now that container size increases. Well, now that container is now also oozing fluid. This is what burn patients do. They lose a tremendous amount of fluid. They're not bleeding per se. They're oozing plasma. Um, and you have a tremendous amount of fluid loss, which now creates hypo uh, hypovolemia, decreased cardiac output, shock, and potentially death if it's not treated. So within the first 18 hours or so, uh, 18 to 24 hours, this patient suffers the highest risk of death, which is why when we talk about actually treating this patient, first things first is we have to sort of calculate the uh, percentage of burn. So I'll pull this down and we'll look at calculation of burn. How do we calculate the actual uh, uh, amount that someone has burned? And is it super important for us to do that? Yes and no. Uh, chances are, if you're watching this, you are bound by a protocol or a standing order by your agency, EMS, fire, whatever. It says that if you have a patient with such and such a degree of burn, such and such a percentage, you have to take them to a burn center. You know, okay, fine. Um, facial burns, hands, joint spaces, genitalia, feet. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of categories uh, uh, to dictate who goes to a burn center versus who doesn't need it. I'm not here to dictate policy. But if we're going to start to calculate burns, we usually look at the rule of nines, of course, so let me go ahead and put a, a picture of the rule of nines up. All right, so if we look at the rule of nines, that's the general overall, what we always learn, okay, each arm is 9%, the front of the body is 18, the back of the body is 18, the head is 9, legs are 18 each, and then of course there's the one percentile. Again, I don't know who came up with that crazy idea, but... The thing about patients who are burned is they are very, very inconsiderate of us when they get burned. All right? They do not burn in these perfect little lines, in these perfect segmented little areas. It's not how people get burned. So for us, it's a swag. All right? It's a scientific wild-ass guess. All right, right now that looks like uh, a second-degree burn or a partial thickness burn. It looks like it could be full thickness burn. Because usually when we start to incorporate rule of nines and we start to uh, try to figure out fluid management uh, based on burns, we're only usually talking about partial and full thickness burns. Not to say that we completely disregard partial thickness, or rather, I'm sorry, not that we disregard uh, superficial or first degree burns, but if somebody is going to succumb from their injuries and really suffer the wrath of these burns, it's going to be from partial thickness or second degree and full thickness third degree. Those are the ones we really uh, concern ourselves with. And that's when these uh, the Parkland uh, burn formula comes in as far as fluid management, but more specifically the rule of nines. So this picture shows you the rule of nines, but right next to it is called the rule of palms, which I think is a bit more appropriate in a lot of these uh, scenarios to where, okay, yeah, you can get a, a, a swag of what the percentage of burn is on somebody by looking at them. But then you can guesstimate based on the size of the patient's palm, not your palm, the patient's palm, uh, as to how much more burn there is. And as a general rule, the patient's palm is 
That's called the rule of palms. So don't be upset to where when you pick up a patient who's suffering from burns and you guesstimate, okay, they're at 28% partial thickness burn and you bring them into the ER and you give them that report. Okay, don't be surprised if you come back in an hour and you find out that their body surface area percentage that was burned was actually more like 35 and it was both uh, second and third degree. Did that mean that you were completely wrong? No, because remember, after you drop that patient off, there's a good chance that they were still cooking internally. that You couldn't even see or treat. So now the burns are even more significant because they haven't stopped burning yet. So I do hold some, way, some value in the rule of nines and the rule of palms. It is important. But at the same time, look at your patient. If they are burned up bad and significantly and you've got access to a burn center, take them there. That's really the, the easiest way to think about it. Um, so when we look at, let me go ahead and pull, actually, I'm going to leave this slide up here for a second. Um, when we look at this, we're also looking at the Parkland burn formula. Now for the ALS providers in the room, if somebody is so significantly burned and all of your focus and attention is going on airway management, don't worry about the fluids, manage the airway and get them to a trauma center, get them to a burn center, whatever you have to do. The IV is nice. Don't get me wrong because you want to manage this patient's pain. That's going to be the biggest thing. And these patients will chew up pain medication like they're chiclets. I mean, nothing. It's nothing for the average size individual to take 150, 200 mics of fentanyl and laugh at you. Uh, these patients need a lot of pain medication. They're going to eat it up. Um, so again, follow your protocol on that one. But the Parkland burn formula for your second and third degree uh, burns of, of significant amount is four cc's. And we try to go with lactate ringers here if we can, but follow your protocol. Uh, four cc's times the percentage of body burned times weight in kilograms. Okay, what that's going to give you is a total amount of cc's for a 24-hour period of time. What you have to do is focus on what they should be getting in the first eight hours, which is half of that total. So let me say that again. Parkland burn formula, four cc's times the body surface area percentage burned by your guesstimation times their weight in kilograms. That's going to give you a total amount of cc's that a patient is supposed to receive in 24 hours. Half of that total has to be infused in the first eight hours. Now, we are not going to have this patient, hopefully, we're not going to have this patient for eight hours. So we're focused more on the hourly uh, formula. So what I want to show you now is called the rule of tens. The rule of tens is a bit more on our wheelhouse. And this is easier for us to figure out. So if we take body percentage area burned and round it to the nearest 10, um, uh, you know, so I'll give you an example here in a second. Multiply that number by 10. Well, that equals your cc's per hour. So if your patient's 70 kilos, um, or rather uh, they're burned 70% uh, of their body, um, and they are... I got formula written down here. Never mind. Let's say that they're burned 60% of their body. Take 60 times 10, 600. Uh, that's 600 cc's an hour. That's roughly what we're looking to do. Is it so important that we get the numbers right? I say, well, are they really burn 60%. Should I give them 600 an hour? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Uh, the fluids are nice. Uh, the Parkland burn formula is nice. However, I'll give a shout out to Virginia Commonwealth University Burn Unit Burn Center um, in the city of Richmond. We did a walkthrough there not long ago. We were talking to one of their burn nurses, and she was saying how a lot of times the Parkland burn formula is too much. Um, they have patients who are third spacing. Uh, by third spacing, it means that they're forcing so much fluid into these patients that they start to start the third space and this fluid starts to ooze out into the peritoneal space or into their abdominal cavity. And they actually have to drain their abdomen of these fluids. It's a bit much. So what they're recommending, and this is just a recommendation as per uh, VCU burn unit, uh, burn center, is two cc's times patient's weight in kilo uh, times body surface area percentage. Just food for thought. Uh, again, follow your protocol. But I just want to look at that Parkland burn formula for a second. Just look at how much fluid we're actually talking about. 
uh, that's a huge amount of fluid to have to give to somebody. So if you have a 100 kilogram patient and they're burned 60% of their body, uh, you know, and we only do it two cc's, uh, you know, as far as that formula goes, that's 12,000 cc. That's 12 liters of fluid in 24 hours. That's a lot of fluid. Half of that, 6,000 cc's or six liters, has to go in in the first eight hours. That's 750 cc's an hour. That's a lot of fluid to give to somebody. So just keep this in mind when we're talking about uh, burn treatment, fluids, uh, uh, pain management. We're not going to get into escharotomies. We're not going to get into anything like that. It's well above our pay grade. Uh, but these are other things that would be done up on a burn unit if somebody were to be so sick or so burned. So let's just back up for a second and let me pull this slide down. So we talked about a number of different things in burns. Uh, we talked about anatomy and physiology of skin. Um, let me make sure to stay on track here. We talked about types of burns. We talked about levels of burns, airway burns, uh, the Jackson wound theory, a burn shock. How do we calculate burns? How do we treat burns? And the treatment of burns, uh, of course, managing the airway is paramount. And pain management is paramount for the ALS folk. Um, but the uh, question's always been wet or dry, wet or dry dressing. Okay, keep it simple. If it's just sunburn and you want to make them comfortable and you want to pour cold water on it, fine. If it makes them feel better, that's fine. But if it's not first degree, if it's a partial thickness to full thickness burn, uh, dry sterile dressings, dry clean dressings, because uh, chances are those blisters are going to pop and the fluid from those blisters is going to moisten that dressing anyway. Uh, so there's no reason for you to add water to it. So now you're adding, adding another vector for microorganisms and now you're also increasing the chances of hypothermia because it's, now you have that wicking effect of that water. Keep it simple. If it's just sunburn, yeah, sure, you want to keep it cool with water, that's fine, I, whatever. Uh, but second degree, third degree, dry sterile dressings, dry clean dressings, that's how we should treat it. Parkland burn formula is nice. Rule of tens is more appropriate for us, for the ALS folk, lactate ringers if we can, but again, follow your protocol. And a lot of pain management. That's really all we can do. So that's burns in a nutshell. Uh, there's a lot more to it. I would recommend ALS providers, if you have the opportunity to attend an ABLS class, Advanced Burn Life Support class, that is a fantastic program uh, hosted by members who work on burn units. They know their shit. They're, that's how to treat burns. You get into rhabdomyolysis. You get into electrical burns and the release of potassium and now cardiac dysrhythmias and this dark myogloriuria. I'm probably mispronouncing that. You get this dark, dark amber urine with rhabdo and this breakdown of muscle tissue and um, escherotomies and thoracic escherotomies and it gets into some wild, wild stuff. So ABLS, Advanced Burn Life Support. Um, if uh, you want to learn a lot about burns, that's the place to go. That's the class to take. This was just, again, a broad stroke overview just to talk about burns in general. Uh, I think that's about it for the day. We're at uh, just about 50 minutes. I want to wrap it up here. I think uh, now i got to think of a good password. I haven't had a good password in a while. Uh, ooh. I don't think we've had this yet. Knife. How about that? Knife. That's a good one. Let's do knife. Having a great time. Thank you so much again. Uh, I don't know what the next video is going to be. Now I've gone over my... Uh, didn't know how long this, this corona thing was going to last, so I had X amount plotted out. Now we're going past that. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to just start making, not making shit up, but I'm going to start, you know, plugging in topics as we go, but anticipate more medical than trauma, because I think that's our weakness uh, in the pre-hospital care arena, especially in the tactical environment. So I'm going to focus on that, because uh, none of us, <laughs> well, at least me specifically and some of whom I work with, we're not the 20-year-old warfighter anymore. So we have to worry about the medical conditions more than traumatic conditions. But uh, So anticipate some more medical uh, than trauma, but I'll try to incorporate both. I'll take any suggestions. Uh, I'm always willing to uh, hear what people want to hear about versus what I think you want to hear about. 
So again, stay COVID free. Um, have a great day. Have a great weekend. Uh, this is the weekend for me. Uh, I don't even know what it is, Saturday or Sunday. I guess this is what retired life is like. Huh? You don't know what day it is anymore. Um, be safe. Thank you again. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Mm-hmm.